Senator Grassley, you're next. Yeah. Uh, before I start, I'd like to make a brief point. Yesterday, Senator Durbin referenced Congress's effort to stop child pornography and the exploitation of minors. I've worked on this issue for decades. In 1983, I supported the Protection of Children Against Sexual Exploitation Act. In 2012, I sent a letter to the Sentencing Commission while Judge Jackson was vice chair. In the letter, I encouraged the Sentencing Commission not to lower sentences for child pornography. I said that, quote, it would be a, a disservice to the American people to have the commission issue a report that advocates for the reduction in sentencing for a class of criminals who cause profound and lasting damage to their victims, end of quote. I'd like to have that uh, put in the record. Without objection. Uh, yesterday, you referred to your record of decisions as the best thing to look at when explaining and evaluating your nomination. But you also said that you haven't had enough cases involving constitutional law to develop a judicial philosophy. If you haven't had uh, to develop a philosophy for deciding cases yet, what else do you think would be helpful for us to look at? So respectfully, Senator, I do have a philosophy. The philosophy is my methodology. It is a philosophy that um, I have developed from practice. Um, unlike some judges who come to appellate work from academia and who have some overarching theory of the law, I approach cases from experience, from practice, and consistent with my constitutional obligations. So my philosophy is one in which I look at cases impartially consistent with my independence as a judicial officer. I understand my limited role in the constitutional scheme and therefore take very seriously all of the constraints on the exercise of my authority that exist uh, in our uh, system. What that means is that at the beginning of every case, I am setting aside my personal views. I'm That's the three steps you gave us? Yes, sir. That, yes. Uh, so you don't have to go into that. Let me go on then. Should the Supreme Court overrule a precedent when it is clear to the justices that the precedent was wrongly decided. Thank you, Senator. Stare decisis, which is the principle uh, that um, the Supreme Court uses at the outset. It's the sort of background rule of uh, judicial um, maintenance of precedence in order to have predictability, stability, uh, in the law is the kind of principle that the court begins with when it is asked to overrule or uh, revisit a precedent. And the court has developed certain factors that it looks at before it actually undertakes to reverse a precedent. One of those factors is the view that the precedent it's reconsidering is wrong, but that's not the only factor. The court also uh, determines, in addition to whether or not the, pre the prior precedent was egregiously wrong, the court has said, um, the court looks at whether there's been reliance on that prior precedent, whether the precedent is workable or has proven workable over time, whether the cases in the area uh, of the precedent have shifted such that the precedent itself is no longer on firm foundation, and whether there have been either new facts or a new understanding of the facts um, that give rise to a need to revisit the precedent. So it's not just um, 
a, a look at whether or not it's wrong. And it's important that the court take into account all of those factors because stare decisis, meaning uh, letting the precedent stand, is a very important pillar of the rule of law. When is it appropriate for a judge to impose a sentence enhancement under the guidelines? Thank you, Senator. The federal sentencing guidelines um, are crafted to assist courts in making sentencing determinations within the broad range that Congress prescribes for cases. For, for crimes. So in the typical case, a defendant is convicted of some crime um, in the federal system. They're usually very serious crimes. And Congress will say, judge, you can give that person a sentence anywhere between zero and 20 years, for example. The sentencing guidelines are designed to set out a series of factors that judges should be looking at when they decide what they're going to sentence that particular person to. And those factors will be things like, if this is a violent crime, does the person have a weapon? If this is a violent crime, was there any injury? And so the judge is looking at these facts, in many cases horrible facts, and calculating the guidelines based on what we call enhancements. Each one of those different characteristics or conditions is an enhancement. So you ask when is it important to, um, to for, when it's appropriate. Well, the judge, judge has to calculate the guidelines in every case. That's how we start the process. But under the statutes, in addition to calculating the guidelines with all of those enhancements, the way our system now works is you determine what the guideline range of punishment is going to be. And then Congress says you look at a series of other factors in addition to the guideline range. And at the end of the day, the judges in the system now are choosing sentences based on both the consideration of the guidelines and also the consideration of the statutory factors that Congress has put forward. Have you ever declined to impose an enhanced sentence on a defendant because you disagreed with the enhancement as a policy matter? Thank you, Senator. Um, yes, and the reason is because of Supreme Court case law concerning um, the way in which the guideline system operates. The Supreme Court has um, determined in a case we discussed yesterday that the guidelines are no longer binding on judges, meaning um, the guidelines you calculate, but you don't have to stay in the guideline range anymore. That was um, the Supreme Court's Booker case. In And I can't remember if it's in that case or in subsequent case law, but the Supreme Court has also made clear that when you are calculating the guideline range in the new system that we're in right now, judges are free, they, the Supreme Court has said, to decide in particular cases whether as a quote unquote policy matter, they disagree with a particular enhancement. That is the state of the law. That is what the Supreme Court has said judges are permitted to do in cases. And so I have in certain cases, given the way in which the guidelines are operating, the disparities that are created in cases, I have at times identified various enhancements that I have disagreed with as a policy matter because the Supreme Court has said that that's the authority of a sentencing judge in our system. Are nationwide injunctions constitutional? Well, Senator. Um, well, you, you, you've issued them. Thank you for letting me address um, that 
circumstance. The reason why I paused is because um, the, what, what I have issued is not technically a nationwide injunction. People call, um, call it that, but in a particular set of cases, administrative agency cases that are brought under the Administrative Procedure Act, these are challenges to agency actions, like agency rules that they have promulgated, and if the challenge is to the procedures that the agency undertook to create the rule, the statute that applies, the Administrative Procedure Act, tells the court that if you agree with the plaintiff that the agency rule is faulty procedurally, the remedy in the statute is to invalidate the rule. That's what Congress tells judges to do. Now, technically, that's not a nationwide injunction. That is <coughs> invalidating a rule that the agency has enacted. It may have nationwide effects because the agency may have implemented its rule nationwide. But what the court is doing is not reaching out and touching everyone in the country. The court is directing the government that has promulgated that rule that the rule is invalid. And that's what the statute tells us we have to do in those cases. That's different than a nationwide injunction because a nationwide injunction would be a situation in which we're not dealing with the rule, we're not dealing with the Administrative Procedure Act, we're dealing with a particular case in which something has happened between the plaintiff and the defendant and the court says, based on what happened in this case, I'm gonna tell everybody in the country that you can't, the defendant, you can't operate in this way anymore. I'm gonna find on the basis of this particular case, and I'm gonna enjoin everyone in the country not to do that anymore. That's a nationwide injunction, which is not what I've done in, I think, the cases that you're talking about. How can the judiciary address concerns about foreign shop, forum shopping, given the rise of nationwide injunctions? Well, um, forum shopping is, um, is a concern that arises when litigants seek to um, go to different places in the country where they think that they may get a better result. And it's something that Congress can address because Congress has the power to uh, determine uh, various aspects of judicial process. Uh, explain the political question doctrine and then what standards would you apply to determine whether a claim before you uh, implicates a political question? So the political question doctrine um, is a doctrine that relates to uh, the jurisdiction of the court. As I mentioned, um, the courts are in um, a particular branch of government, the judicial branch that is limited in its power. The courts can't um, make policy, they can't reach out into the world and decide that certain things are good or bad and then address them. They have to wait for cases to come um, and decide them. And when a case comes, it has to be presenting a question of law for the court to answer it. If a person comes to the court and they ask the court to answer something that is properly in the province of Congress, if they ask a political question, then the court has to say, I'm sorry, that's not my role. So I had, for example, a case that involved um, uh, Yemeni citizens who, um, I'm trying to get the facts exactly right, but they um, had relatives, they were, I think they were resident in the United States and they had relatives in Yemen 
a war torn area. This is um, a few f- few years ago, and they came to the court, me asking if I could direct the administration to extract their relatives from Yemen, that they wanted me to order um, the executive branch to send in troops and get their relatives out because it was um, obviously dangerous for their relatives to be in that country. And what I said in that circumstance is essentially, I don't have jurisdiction to do that because what you're asking me to do is a political question. That the question of when and where troops can be sent and who um, can be extracted from foreign governments belongs with the executive branch. And so you have to ask them. Um, And so I said, I have no jurisdiction. That's a political question doctrine. Um, and it's well established in in our law. Yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Durbin, you said that a judge, as a judge, you are, quote, trying in every case to stay in your lane, and end of quote. That's the same time you gave us the three steps you go through as you work yourself through a case. You also described the text of uh, law as a constraint on your authority. But in several cases, uh, I'll list, make the road New York, AFL, CI versus Trump, Watervale Marine Companies, and others, the DC Circuit reversed your decision or criticized your reasoning for failing to follow a clear and unambiguous text why didn't the clear text of the law constrain your authority in these cases? Um, thank you, Senator. You mentioned three cases. Um, certainly with respect to the second one, um, the D.C. Circuit didn't say that the text was clear, and in fact that's um, what happens in cases that judges at the trial level do their best to make interpretations. In that case, um, it involved a channeling provision. This is um, AFG versus Trump. Um, It involved a a provision, a statute that was designed to channel um, the um, judicial authority into an agency Um, And I interpreted the statute, and I thought that the arguments that were being made, um, the claims that were being made, were not ones that Congress had intended to channel. And I went through the analysis, and I explained my reasoning as to why I thought I still had jurisdiction, and I went on to address uh, the merits, which is the duty of the judge if they determine they do have jurisdiction. The... D.C. Circuit disagreed. They wrote an opinion that interpreted the statute differently with respect to those claims, but it was a case of first impression as to what those claims meant and whether they were supposed to be channeled or not, and that happens. Um, District judges do their best, and sometimes the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court haven't spoken to the issue, and the parties disagree. In Make the Road, um, I explained that uh, what I was attempting to do in light of Congress's enactments, not only the particular immigration uh, provision, but also the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, was reconcile the statutes of Congress, which is something that um, the courts also are supposed to do, that there are statutory interpretation canons that make clear that courts are supposed to understand that Congress intends for its statutes to work together, and to the extent that you are interpreting and the claim is made that allows you to do that, that's the sort of way in which interpretation is done. I can go through my actual analysis. I did it yesterday as we talked, but um, there was a, a good faith disagreement between me and the Court of Appeals, which gets to decide um, as to what 
the language meant and whether or not um, Congress actually intended to exclude the APA um, using that language under those circumstances. Thank you very much. Senator Leahy. 